topic today is vesicular rashes blistering rashes in children i think somewhere uh, probably two years ago i had uh, already made a lecture on uh, the differential diagnosis of blistering rashes in children but recently came across a case in which there was a little bit of diagnostic uncertainty and it was a difficult case uh, presented with a vesicular rash so i thought i would take this opportunity uh, to present the differential diagnosis of blistering rashes once again and if you have watched my previous video this would be a good sort of a refresher for you so without further ado let's jump in and get started now first thing what is a blistering rash or what is a vesicular rash a blistering rash or a vesicular rash is a condition in which the skin has caught fluid filled lesions so there is a rash on the skin it could be any part of the skin it could be one part of the skin it could be multiple parts of the skin but these parts of the skins are actually dotted with some lesions and these lesions are filled with what with fluid and in most of the cases this fluid is clear fluid it might look a little bit turbid but in most cases it is clear fluid which is filling up these uh, lesions so we call it as a blistering or a vesicular rash now there is a uh, there is a bit of terminology which you need to understand because that is based on the uh, what you call the, uh, the 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 size of the lesions so the first one is vesicle a vesicle is a rash in which you've got these fluid filled lesions but these fluid filled lesions are smaller than five uh, millimeter in diameter so if you measure them roughly they would be less than five millimeter in diameter so less than 0.5 centimeter or five millimeter lesion is known as a vesicle if it is larger than that let's say if it is 0 0.6 centimeter or six millimeter or onward maybe one centimeter two centimeter onward then we call it a bullet so bullet is a big like bubble like a, like a lesion so small one are known as vesicles large ones are known as bully and because these are uh, fluid filled lesions they've got a tendency to burst and when they burst they usually heal with some form of encrustation so if there is form of encrustation or some form of like solid scabs formed on these lesions we call it as a crust so if these lesions they burst open they might heal with some form of scaling or scapping and that is the phenomena is known as an encrustation and the lesion itself is known as a crust so here in the diagram uh, you can see here there are small these lesions very small like probably two to three millimeter which are filled with clear fluid these are vesicles here you can see a large one this large one is probably greater than five millimeter it's filled with clear fluid we call it as a bullet and here you can see a burst bullet which has been healed by some uh, scabbing or forming of a scaly material on top of this uh, burst bullet which is known as crust and the process is known as encrustation okay folks moving on to sort of you know how do we classify these uh, blistering rashes or vesicular diseases it depends it depends whether the lesion is confined to one anatomical area or whether two or more anatomical areas are involved so if just one area is involved let's say it is the back of the hand let's say it is the face let's say it is the neck let's say it is just one single anatomical region we call it as what localized blistering disease or localized vesicular lesion or localized disease if two or more anatomical regions are involved let's say it is present on the face on one hand or face both hands or let's say face chest abdomen limbs we call it what as generalized uh, blistering disease or a generalized vesicular rash so remember localized is just one anatomical area and generalized one is two or more than two like could be the whole body so that is how we basically classify any vesicular rash whether it's a localized one or whether it's a generalized one and some good examples where a rash would just like um, you know affect one single anatomical region is like what we call as a fixed drug eruption a fixed drug eruption is usually a sort of an adverse reaction which is manifested on the skin to any medicine most of the time it is usually to sulfur drugs but 
it can happen to any drug and usually you see that after some time of consuming that drug <coughs> excuse me what happens that a fixed bulle or a few vesicles they might prop up at one anatomical position and they've got the propensity to happen again and again at the same spot so we call it as a fixed drug eruption that is a one of a classical example of localized vesicular rash sometimes bullus impetigo bullus impetigo can happen in many forms but sometimes bullus impetigo can just affect one part of the body with like let's say the face where it would start with a few lesions that have got uh, golden honey encrustation and then you'll see here and there a few vesicular spots might pop up so that is known as the bullus impetigo so bullus impetigo basically is caused by the uh, toxins produced by streptococci staphylococci which produce lesions far away from the initial site of infection and though it can happen on a generalized basis as well sometimes what you see is a small part of the body or the skin being affected so we call it a localized bullus impetigo and the third thing where you might see a single anatomical region being affected by a vesicular rash is uh, dyshydrotic eczema so dyshydrotic eczema also known as pompolix usually happens on the fingers on the hands where you might see very deep seated small tiny blisters on the uh, palmer side of the hand or along the uh, medial and lateral border of the fingers they are very itchy and uh, uh, they usually happen on a single anatomical region though it can happen like you know at multiple spots as well but as i said as i said like you know sometimes it can just affect one single anatomical region and this hydrotic eczema is an example of that there are some other one as well but i'm just going through the common ones which you would definitely come across in your practice then coming down to the generalized one again the list is not an exhaustive one i mean uh, there are so many disorders diseases that can cause a generalized vesicular rash but again going through some of the common ones varicella or chicken pox so varicella or chicken pox whether it's a primary infection in the form of varicella or the secondary or reactivation of varicella in the form of herpes zoster though herpes zoster usually tends to occur on a localized basis because you will see a localized rash in a dermatomal fashion burning uh, itching and is usually following a sort of a pattern which is actually the path of the nerve but the primary infection in the form of varicella usually presents with a vesicular rash a papular vesicular rash hand foot mouth disease which is caused by the coxsackie virus basically causes a vesicular eruption mostly uh, occurs on the hand on the feet but that doesn't mean that it just occurs on the hand on the feet there might be lesions on the rest of the body as well but you will see that the density of the lesions is more on the hands so it's more dense on the periphery on the hands on the feet and you will see a few lesions inside the mouth as well so how hand foot mouth disease which is called by coxsackie virus is another skin disease which causes generalized vesicular rash bullus impetigo i discussed earlier that bullus impetigo can cause a, a localized disease as well but uh, sometimes it can cause a generalized bullus uh, disease where there are bullus lesions or vesicular region spread on the body with encrustation and that can give you a diagnostic dilemma because that very much resembles a very bad varicella as well so bad chicken pox where the lesions are very dense widespread can mimic uh, bullus ampetigo because on the face of it they look very much similar to one another so bullus impetigo basically is a staphylococcus or a streptococcal infection but the primary infection is somewhere else but what happens because of the uh, the toxins these toxins they cause uh, you know skin lesions far away from the place where the primary infection occurred uh, the other thing that uh, you need to know is that in bullus impetigo the staphylococcal or the streptococcal toxins if they go into the bloodstream if it's a more of an invasive phenomenon which the toxin is going into the bloodstream then it can cause another variety of uh, the bullous impetic which we call as um, as uh, what we call um, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome in which there are big you know bully and they just like peel off and if you generally like you know start to rub the skin you will see that the superficial layer they start coming off from the skin so um, that is what we call as um, 
the uh, staphylococcal skeletal sin skin syndrome so staphylococcal skeletal skin syndrome is very much closely associated with bullous impet tiger the only thing is that the toxins here are actually in the bloodstream unlike bullous impet tiger in which the toxin can cause skin disease but there is no toxin inside the bloodstream then another variant uh, of the blistering disorder is steven johnson syndrome or erythema multiforme major this usually occurs as an immune mediated reaction to so many things it can occur uh, you know it's in certain types of infections like mycoplasma infections mycoplasma pneumonia or sometimes it can occur as an immune mediated reaction to certain types of drugs like certain types of anti convulsant certain types of sulfur drugs uh, contraceptives sometimes it can occur as a part of the physiological you know process going on in the body like for example it can happen in pregnancy as well so Steven Johnson syndrome basically is that uh, there are different types of lesions basically widespread uh, that's why it's known as multiforme because there are so many different types of lesions papules macules vesicles bullae and usually what happens is that the hallmark of this is that some of the lesions they resemble like a bull eye so they are known as target lesions so those target lesions might be found here and there on the skin and usually a mucosal surface is also involved in erythema multiforme major or Steven Johnson syndrome that's usually oral cavity or sometimes the eyes can be involved as well then there are a few other ones the linear IgA disease which is also known as a chronic bullous disease of childhood I will explain it later eczema herpeticum is basically herpes simplex skin infection in a uh, skin which has been weakened by eczema or atopic dermatitis and last but not the least is sweet syndrome or acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis which again is an immune medi mediated uh, disease usually can occur sporadically or sometimes occurs um, in certain um, as a part of a paraneoplastic process usually in children who have got some underlying malignancy they can come up up in a rash blistering rash which we call as acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis also given the name as of sweet syndrome which we will discuss later on so this is how we classify blistering disease into localized and generalized forms moving on First, eczema herpeticum. So let's start with eczema herpeticum. Here you can see a rash which is vesicular and which is spread. If you see more on the peripheries in children, more so on the flexural surfaces. You know, eczema can affect extensive surfaces in older people, but in children, usually it starts like, you know, very young, it might start from the face and then it goes on the chest and then usually it's as the children they grow up it usually has got the predisposition to involve the flexural areas or the peripheral area so here you can see the flexural area of the uh, elbow is involved the forearm is involved and the wrist is also involved here you can see the flexural surface of the lower limb is involved and you can see widespread uh, vesicular lesions so these lesions they usually happen on an underlying damaged skin and that damaged skin is basically the skin areas which have got the flare-up of eczema. So as the eczema flare-ups, there are breaks in the skin and somehow herpes simplex from somewhere can infect these cells and causes widespread eczema, uh, widespread uh, herpes infection of the skin which is known as eczema herpeticum. So eczema herpeticum is nothing but basically herpes simplex virus infection of the skin which has been damaged by atopic dermatitis or by eczema it's usually treated with the topical as well as oral or intravenous a cyclovir so it depends how bad the condition is how well or unwell the child is so usually you can treat it with either topical medications topical medications topical that is a cyclovir or you can give oral acyclovir if the lesions are extensive or if the child is unwell then IV acyclovir. So this has to be given for some time uh, till the lesion they start healing and the infection is brought under control. So eczema herpeticum basically is a blistering rash, a vesicular rash which occurs in skin damage by eczema. Okay, then coming to another condition which is very itchy just like eczema but this usually occurs 
on the extensor surfaces. I told you eczema herpeticum and dermatitis herpetiformis they might look similar but the distribution differs. Eczema herpeticum is mostly localized to flexural surfaces. So there might be like a few lesions on the extensor surface also but if you see it would be densely you know present on the flexural surface. But dermatitis herpetiformis basically the lesions are dense on the extensive surface, especially on the back. So you might see it around the elbows, around the front of the knees and on the buttocks. So basically, it's a very intensely pruritic. It's very itchy rash in which there are tiny vesicles and erosions. Obviously, when they, when you know, obviously when they burst open, they can have erosion and encrustation and they usually occur on extensive surfaces. And we have seen that they are usually associated with celiac disease though the interesting thing is that majority of those children who have got dermatitis herpetiformis they do not have any gi symptoms and it's only when they you are working up for dermatitis herpetiformis that you will see that they turn a positive for celiac disease as well so it's usually associated with celiac disease and the treatment is with gluten-free diet so as the child is put on gluten-free diet the lesion they start uh, clearing up if the gluten-free diet is not working, then we can try a drug which is known as Tapsone. So Tapsone in a dose of 2 mg per kilogram body weight to a maximum of 100 mg can be given daily for dermatitis herpetiformis. But it's also very important if you start somebody on Dapsone therapy, you have to see that they do not have underlying glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency because if you've got G6PD deficiency and you start them on Dapsone, they will go into hemolytic anemia. Okay, let me give you a case study. So this was the case that I came across last week and it was a um, two and a half year old a male child who presented to the children's emergency department a widespread rash progressively growing worse so this child started having a rash seven days ago uh, it started as a few lesions he was seen by his uh, primary care provider and they thought he had chicken pox so they said well it's a self-limiting condition just give if he's got if he's febrile just give him paracetamol anyhow a few days later the rash got more worse so he went back to his primary care provider. So they thought like it's a bad varicella, which is spreading. So he was started on oral acyclovir medication. So when we saw him, he was still on oral acyclovir. But the thing was that, that the rash had progressively gone even more worse. So now he had a very widespread vesicular rash with encrustation. Some of the lesions were weeping. It was very densely present on the face, on his torso and on his limbs as well but strangely on examination he was clinically well he was a for a while he was doing very well his observation and its physiological parameters were all within normal limits so this was a child who looked very relatively well but with a very bad skin rash uh, we were not able to take pictures but uh, something uh, i have tried to find um, an image from the net which you know somehow closely resemble this one and that is this one so if you see these were the types of rash that was present on his body so densely like you know small bullet uh, vesicles some of them with clear fluid some of them were burst open some of them were scabs some of them were encrustation there were a few excoriation mark it was very much pruritic the scabs were dark and it was present all over his uh, body some of the lesion had coalesced with one another where you know they had like and you could see some fresh blistering around the edges as well so obviously looking at that child's condition uh, and you know being on acyclovir and getting progressively worse my initial impression was that that this doesn't look like chicken pox i mean why if he's on acyclovir and he looks clinically well though the rash is still spreading and it becoming more and more worse so the thing was that one thing was to some extent uh even if i call it not certain it was more probable that this was not chicken pox it was something else so we thought about the other differential diagnosis of uh, blistering rashes like whether this child has got bullous impetigo but if he had bullous impetigo he should have been more febrile he should have been more unwell then the third thing was is there any immune mediated sort of reaction could it be steven johnson syndrome so some of the lesion they did look like target lesions but 
there was hardly any uh, mucosal involvement. There were like one small solitary region inside the mouth, but eyes and everything was fine. So again, not very much convinced that it could be Steven Johnson syndrome. So then there were a few other is that could this be what we call as uh, the chronic bullous disease of uh, childhood because if you you look closely at these lesions you can see that there is a sort of a, a you know a rim of freshly formed vesicles around the central base uh, you know which has been scabbed so we thought it might be the Cronus bullous disease of childhood and again if that was a thing uh, we would have to take a biopsy from the skin and send it for immunofluorescence because usually IgA uh, chronic disease bullous disease of childhood or IgA linear dermatosis you see that the there is a sort of a linear infiltration of IgA at the basement membrane and that can be detected by immunofluorescence but for that you need a skin biopsy so we had to admit this child and uh, at the same time treat him with IV antibiotics so that there's no superimposed uh, super infection of these lesions and then we had a dermatology consult to uh, see if this uh, child uh, you know would needed a biopsy and uh, you know what could be the underlying diagnosis in initial, eventually it turned out that he had this chronic bullous disease of childhood it was not very cellular basically somehow this had been triggered uh, and uh, again if it is chronic bullous disease of childhood usually it's treated with oral or intravenous uh, corticosteroids or sometimes steps on as well uh, so that is chronic uh, chronic uh, bullous disease of uh, childhood uh, then coming to impetigo impetigo basically is a bacterial infection of the superficial layers of skin usually caused by streptococci or staphylococci again it can happen in two forms the bullous and the non-bullous the non-bullous form is more common usually occurs on the face around the nasal area in which there are um, you know sort of a lesion small vesicles which then you know have got encrustation uh, honey colored uh, honey golden colored encrustation it's usually treated with either topical or oral antibiotics and then there is a bullous uh, variety as well and again i told you bullous can be localized or it can be generalized if it is involving more than two anatomical regions in which the staphylococcal toxins they usually travel far from the initial site of infection and they cause these uh, bullous uh, vesicle formation or bullet formation which can then rupture and uh, heal by encrustation or sometimes can get secondarily infected as well so here in these you can see like you know these are sort of a big bully uh, you know which is filled with some slightly turbid uh, looking fluid so on the shoulder or on the neck here you can see a lesion which has been you know of a denuded so like the blister has popped open and you can see the raw surface and here you can see the child who has got some uh, widespread lesions you can see it's around the nose with some encrustation some golden honey colored encrustation as well and it's widespread on the face so usually facial um, encrustation with honey you know honey golden colored encrustation is usually more suggestive of a uh, empetigo rather than anything else then this is another image in which you can see this is another form of generalized bullous empetigo in which you can see there are lesions which are widespread on the torso front and back uh, vesicular lesions these le some of these lesions have popped open with encrustation and uh, though it can resemble a widespread like a chicken box but uh, this is basically bullous empetigo so sometimes in clinical practice you might be confused whether it's chicken pox or whether it's bullous empetigo so remember i mean uh, chicken pox uh, usually kids who have got chicken pox and time it starts with a with, with the febrile illness but you know the fever settles down the 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 lesions it might take a while before they heal up in bullous empetigo you will see that there would be some form of primary lesions visible somewhere and that would be on the face so on the face if even we see a few primary lesions like you know which have got golden honey colored encrustation uh, then you should be thinking of uh, bullous empetigo uh, sometimes it might be very difficult to differentiate so in that particular case if there is no way to differentiate between that and you don't have like sort of a good uh, laboratory facilities to uh, you know do a sort of a skin biopsy and check the fluid whether it's viral or uh, you know again I mean if it is bullous empetigo remember that you will not get uh, positive cultures from these lesions because it's caused by toxin not the bacteria themselves 
so that becomes a diagnostic challenge so and sometimes you might have to treat them with antivirals as well as antibacterials and uh, uh, these are some of the dilemmas you know if if you if if you are not sure about that then you might have to treat it with a iv or a oral acyclovir as well as oral antibiotics like anti staphylococcal or anti streptococcal antibiotics uh, this is acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis which is also known as sweet syndrome so basically in this there is a febrile illness which is followed by these vesicular lesions and if you see these lesions uh, what happened is that they have got a sort of a clear denude usually comes up in vesicles and bullae and um, what happens is that uh, uh, there might be an underlying malignancy it might be underlying leukemias or some form of cancers which might be responsible for this thing because this is caused by a dysregulated immune response in the skin in which the uh, antibodies they actually attack the skin cells and leads to intensive uh, blistering bully formation and uh, it can then you know it, it can pop up and it can cause secondary uh, bacterial infection of these lesions as well but if you take a biopsy and if you examine it you will see that there is marked dense neutrophilic infiltration and that neutrophilic leukocytosis might also be evident on the blood test so sweet syndrome or acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis basically is a condition in which there would be fever with dense neutrophilic infiltrates into these skin lesions and these skin lesions are usually in the form of uh, bullae or vesicles with severe encrustation uh, in the middle and again if that's a condition it's usually treated with uh, oral or iv steroids or with tapsone so the same treatment that we use for linear iga disease or chronic bullous disease of childhood is the same treatment that we use for acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis or sweet syndrome as well uh, this is a, a slide which shows the what can be the other features of sweet syndrome uh, but nevertheless remember that uh, usually uh, i mean if i have to condense it and uh, you know give you the summary then it's fever with skin lesions usually in a backdrop of some form of malignancy so if a child presents with sweet syndrome and they've got all these lesions then you have to do an extensive workup to see if there is any underlying malignancy like lymphoma or leukemia as far as the treatment is concerned the treatment goes by giving them iv or oral steroids and if it's not working then dapsone if dapsone is not working you might have to go um, you know using certain types of uh, immunosuppressants uh, like cyclosporine so this was sweet syndrome uh, these are a few lesions uh, in which you can see these are again uh, different forms of uh, sweet syndrome or acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis here you can see that there is a rim of um, vesicles with central area of inflammation and uh, some form of scabbing as well there are dense neutrophilic infiltrate there's another form which you can see on the face this is what you will see on a skin biopsy i'm not going to into much detail of that there are a few other lesions here you can see a purplish rim uh, of uh, you know obviously this is um, some form of uh, skin necrosis at the periphery and you can see a vesicle in the center and here you can see another uh, image in which there are dense uh, there is dense inflammation and uh, papillovesicular lesions so acute febrile neutrophilic dermatosis can present in various forms and usually associated with some underlying malignancy then we come to steven johnson syndrome steven johnson syndrome or erythema multiforme major basically is a condition in which there is an immune mediated reaction uh, in the skin it can occur in certain types of infections like mycoplasma pneumonia or mycoplasma infections it can occur as a reaction to certain types of drugs and what you see is that uh, there are rashes which is a polymorphous rash so it would comprise of papules macules vesicle bullae and the hallmark are is target lesions so target lesions are basically bullite like lesions in which there is a central area a light area and then there's a dark area at the periphery and uh, it might be a few lesions or it might be so many on the skin 
but remember if you even if you see a few target lesions that's usually suggestive of erythema multiforme major but the clinical criteria is that there is skin plus two mucous membrane involvement so there should be some oral involvement and some eye involvement only then we call it stephen johnson syndrome if it's just one like and if only the skin is involved then we don't call it stephen johnson syndrome we just call it uh, erythema multiforme minor so, so Stephen Johnson syndrome is basically erythema multiforme major in which their skin plus mucosal involvement. Again, this is treated by IV steroids. Uh, again, you might have to give IV antibiotics to, you know, sort of prevent any or treat any secondary bacterial infections. Uh, give them IV fluids and treat the lesions like burns. Because remember, in all these blistering rashes, if uh, they pop open and you know the underlying uh, raw skin is exposed then there would not be a lot of evaporation from that there would be chance of secondary infection so then you have to treat the lesions themselves like burns obviously you will treat them either if you depending on the etiology either you are treating them with the let's say oral iv steroids or with dapsone or with iv antibiotics but the lesions themselves have also to be taken care of and uh, usually you would clean them you would make sure that they don't get infected and uh, they might have to be dressed and treated like like regular burns so uh, this was all about uh, the blistering rashes in children we have tried to cover some of the basic uh, you know uh, differentials of the blistering rash so the list is a big one there are so many other conditions as well which can present with this but obviously uh, that is for the dermatologist you know to consider that as far as a pediatrician is concerned you should think of these few common things uh, and the diagnostic dilemmas that they can present with because on the face value these rashes might look very much similar to one another and because the management differs sometimes it's become very difficult to differentiate so again you can use your clinical sense to see where the lesion is more dense whether it's on the flexor surface whether it's on the extensor surfaces whether it's the mucus is involved or not whether there has been a history let's say if you are thinking about whether it's a bullous empatite or varicella so let's say if there's a history of varicella and the siblings then it will go more in the favor of varicella but let's say there's no history then you might think it might be very slow or it might be bullous and petigo. you look around if there is any like so primary lesions around the face so again as i said your clinical sense your clinical knowledge would basically help you in differentiating between these conditions but sometimes it becomes very difficult you might have to treat for all these conditions at the same time till the diagnosis is clear so i hope you have liked this video give me a thumbs up if you've liked it and if you haven't subscribed to my channel please do subscribe if you have any questions please put it down in the comment section below and I would answer those questions as soon as possible. Have a very good day. Take care and bye-bye.